In the previous lessons, we discussed the transient thermal analysis and specific heat of the materials. Now let's try to apply this knowledge to real-life problems using simulation. The first case is about stent cooling process. Stents are tiny tubes that are inserted into passageway to open blocked vessels and restore the flow of blood or other fluids. Have you ever wondered how such delicate medical devices are manufactured? The commonly used material for the stent is nitinol, a metal alloy of nickel and titanium. The stents go through annealing and quenching processes to obtain the required geometric and material characteristics. During the annealing process, the stents are kept at high temperature for a certain period of time. Then during the quenching process, the heated stents are cooled down rapidly. Here, the cooling rate is very important because if it's too slow, it can allow the thermodynamic forces to change the microstructure of the material and cause weakness in the material. And if it's too fast, it can cause brittleness, cracks, or temperature-induced stresses. Let's perform the quenching process on the stents using transient thermal analysis. In this problem, we'll assume that the stent has already been annealed at a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius and is to be cooled down to room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius. For the quenching process, we'll compare the use of two different fluids, water and forced air. With this problem, we'll try to understand the factors affecting heat transfer and see how it is a time-dependent process. We'll also use cyclic symmetry to speed up the simulation. When the geometry and loading on the model are cyclically repeating, we can apply the cyclic symmetry method. In this approach, we can slice the model in a single symmetric sector and consider the end faces of the sector as cyclic interfaces, which provide a continuous repeating boundary condition. In our case, we'll define the density, thermal conductivity, and specific heat for the nitinol. Different quenchings are reflected by different convection film coefficient when defining convection boundary condition. Convection will be discussed later, but for now we can think of it as a mode of heat transfer that dissipates heat from the body to the environment. For this simulation, the initial temperature is 400 degrees Celsius. We'll apply convection boundary condition to all the faces of the stent except the cyclic boundaries. We'll also apply 20 degrees Celsius to the ambient temperature. After we solve the simulation and plot the maximum temperature history for both scenarios, it's evident that the quenching in water is more effective to cool down the stand temperature. If we observe the temperature results at a time of 0 0.09 seconds, the maximum temperature in the stand is around 49 degrees Celsius for water cooling and 234 degrees Celsius for forced air cooling. Coming back to the maximum temperature history for the two quenchings, we can see that for water cooling, it took around 0.25 seconds to cool down from 400 to 20 degrees Celsius. For the forced air cooling method, it took almost one second to cool down to room temperature. So for this specific sample, water cooling is almost four times faster than forced air cooling. The takeaway of this example is that using simulation, we can analyze the cooling process and choose the appropriate quenching that satisfies our requirement. For the second example, let's now investigate an application in our daily life, an electric iron. An electric iron consists of a heating coil which converts electric energy to heat energy. When we turn on the switch, heat is generated inside the heating element and is conducted into the adjacent bodies. The metal base, which is now heated, transfers heat by conduction to the clothes. The handle is made up of an insulating material and is to be held constantly by a person. Thus, we do not expect it to be heated up, so we will not consider it for the analysis. Let's perform a transient thermal analysis to see how the temperature increases with time. Initially, the iron is at an ambient temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. We'll apply the internal heat to the heating element to model the heat generation. In this example, we have modeled the parts having shear topology instead of contact, which ensures no temperature drop at the interfaces. The heat is also dissipated away from the iron surfaces to the environment by convection. 
let's now define the material properties for the electric iron. Isotropic materials are used and they are assumed now to be dependent on temperature. Similar to the stent simulation, there are three material properties defined for each material, and they are density, thermal conductivity, and specific heat. The case and the handle of the electric iron are made of plastics, which are a good insulator, and the metal base, middle layer, and the heating element are made of structural steel, which is a good conductor of heat. This table shows the material properties for each material. It can be observed that, generally, good heat conductors have lower heat capacity, and heat insulators have a higher heat capacity and a lower thermal conductivity. Now, let's have a look at the simulation results. With transient analysis, we can see the whole temperature history. After 100 seconds, we can see the highest temperature in the heating element and the body rises to 200 degrees Celsius and is still showing a tendency to increase. In the real world, an electric iron usually has a thermostat and it will cut off the circuit to avoid overheating. We can include the handle to see if there's any noticeable temperature change within the handle. Furthermore, we can solve a separate transient analysis to see how long it may take to cool down the iron to an acceptable temperature that won't cause any burns. Now, you can try these two simulation examples yourself by following the instructions in the simulation section. You can start with the geometry, set up the problem, solve it, and then analyze the results.